When the Buddha has your focus in the present moment, it's because there's work to be done, and you don't know how much time you have to do it, but you do know that you have this moment, this breath. As the Buddha say, you should reflect. If I live just for one more breath, there's a lot of good I can do. What kind of good can you do with one breath? We can look at your mind. And if you see there's anything in the mind that needs straightening out, you do it. You see that it's wandering off someplace where it shouldn't be going, you bring it back. And there's a lot of good there. Because a lot of the trouble in the world, a lot of trouble in our lives, comes from the fact that the mind starts wandering off and you don't hold it in check. You start going wherever you want to go, thinking whatever you want to think. And you, the mind can take it down, <coughs> excuse me, to take itself down some strange alleyways. So when you find a good road, which is the breath. You want it to stay on that road. It gives you a standard of measurement. Stay right here. Stay right here, right now. Don't wait for a little time further on in the hour. Right now you want to be right here. Because how much time do we have? We don't know. The Buddhist teachings on the present moment are always focused on, or placed in the context of contemplation of death. Death can come at any time. There's no warning sign, no warning signal, no notice is served that you have X number of days. And you don't want to die with unfinished work. Now the ultimate finished work, of course, would be total awakening. But you want to minimize the unfinished work. So everything that's unimportant, everything that clutters up the mind, clear it away. Ask yourself what really is important right now. And be as honest as possible with yourself. The question sometimes arises, why does the Buddha have you be so careful with the precept on lying? Say, for example, you want to tell a funny story that involves some real people, but you exaggerate a little bit, and the exaggeration is for a funny effect. And your listeners know that you're not trying to deceive them, and you know that you're not trying to deceive them, you're just trying to entertain. And people say, what's wrong with that? Why does that count against the pre precept against lying? It's because if you're careless in how you frame your statements about the world, you're going to be careless about how you look at the mind, because the mind, as a John Chai used to say, is a liar. The first thing you begin to realize as you really look carefully at the mind is how much it lies to itself. The question sometimes arises with regard to the, that fourth precept, what's wrong with white lies? After all, they're compassionate. But here again, how pure is your compassion? It's so easy to justify something, saying that we'll have compassionate motives. But there may be something else lying behind. And if not really honest with yourself, not really scrupulous and rigorous in how you look at things, describe things, it's very easy to miss the behind-the-scenes motivations that are not so skillful, the ones that are hiding for good reason. Because they know that if they display themselves openly, you wouldn't want to be seen following that kind of motivation. But as long as it's hidden, you're okay. That's the attitude. That's precisely the attitude we're trying to 
uncover here. There's that great paradox where the, the Buddha says, don't leave things covered up because they get damp and moldy. It's things that are exposed to the sky that don't get damp. Now, of course, things exposed to the sky are exposed to the rain, but they're also exposed to the sun. Whereas things that get covered, rain seeps in and there's nothing to dry it out. So try to keep everything open and uncovered in your mind. And making a practice that whatever you say is going to be a correct representation of what you actually believe is true. And you find yourself stumbling over areas where in the past you tended to be a little bit careless, a little bit sloppy, imprecise. Or you fudge things a little bit. And as you get more careful with your speech, then it's going to turn into being more careful as you observe your mind. The verbal fabrications, the directed thought and evaluation that run your meditation will have been exercised. After all, it's the same mind talking to other people as talking to itself. So you want to be really clear about what's happening, how you describe things, make sure that it's accurate as best you can. Because after all, when you're going to be identifying the different hindrances that come up in the mind, the different skillful qualities that can come up in the mind, you want your identification to be accurate. You don't want to mistake, say, an inquisitive mind state for a doubtful mind state. The inquisitive state, of course, is a factor for awakening. The doubtful mind state, the one that just doubts everything, but doesn't do anything to erase its doubts. Just It's content to sit there and say, well, I'm not sure about this, and leave it there. That's a hindrance. And so when a question comes up in the mind, ask yourself, what is the purpose behind the question? Is it there just to say, well, as long as my question isn't answered, I'm not going to practice. I'm not going to give myself fully to the practice. Or is it really an inquisitive question that wants to know? You have to look not only at the official motivation for your actions, but also the behind-the-scenes ones. And you want to be able to identify them clearly and accurately. So this habit you develop of being really scrupulous in how you talk, saying things that are true, beneficial, and timely, helps you become more true, beneficial, and timely in how you observe what's going on in the mind. It's interesting that when the Buddha sets out the various combinations of true and false, beneficial, unbeneficial, timely and untimely. There's one combination that he doesn't even consider as a possibility, and that says something could be false but beneficial. For him that's not a possibility at all. So white lies. There's no room for white lies. There's no room for humorous lies. It doesn't mean having to be grim, it's simply that if you're going to express your humor, try to do it in ways that are in line with the truth. I mean, there's plenty of irony out there in the world, the way things are. So you can be humorous and not have to exaggerate. At the same time, you can be compassionate, not by misrepresenting the truth to people who you feel aren't, aren't ready to receive the truth, but learning how to avoid the topic. If you see a topic as the conversation is heading in that direction, steer it off as quickly as you can before it really gets there, so that the fact that you're avoiding it is not obvious. Or you can learn how to phrase things so they're not 
misrepresenting the truth, but you're not divulging information, say, that your, mis <clears throat> your listener might not be able to take or your listener might actually abuse. In this way, too, the precept on against lying is helpful for the meditation because it exercises your discernment. I was reading someone from a, another branch of Buddhism saying that wisdom or discernment with regard to the precepts means knowing when to follow the precepts and when not to. That's lazy discernment. It's hard to call it discernment at all. It's kind of a cleverness, maybe. But real discernment knows how to main, maintain your precepts and at the same time not cause any inadvertent harm by being too straight arrow in how you interpret the precepts. In other words, you learn how to think of your life through ahead of time. If someone asks me about this, how do I respond in a way that's not a lie? And it doesn't divulge information that might be abused. That's a real exercise of your discernment. And when your discernment is exercised like that, then it's the same discernment you're going to bring to your meditation. It's because of this that the Buddha said that virtue and discernment wash each other. And by here, virtue, he meant not only virtue, but also concentration. Virtue and concentration on the one hand, discernment on the other hand. He said are actually like two hands. When you're washing your hands, your left hand washes your right hand, your right hand washes your left hand. That way they both get clean. So as you go through the day, remember, it's part of the practice. We're not practicing only when we're sitting here with our eyes closed or when we're doing walking meditation. Following the precepts is part of the practice. It's part of the training of the mind. Years back when John Sowat was leading a retreat back in Massachusetts, at the end of the retreat he was asked, how do we carry the practice into daily life? And he said, oh, follow the five precepts. Some of the people got upset because he thought he was implying that Lay people couldn't handle meditation in daily life, but that wasn't the case. Your meditation requires a solid foundation. Training in the precepts is training the mind. Remember the Pali word for meditation, bhavana, means to develop. Whatever way you can to manage to develop good qualities in the mind. Let go of unskillful qualities. It means that whatever right now you're practicing in, whether it's right now while you're sitting here with your eyes closed, or right now when you're cooking, or right now when you're working in the orchard, or right now when you're sitting around talking with others, there's always something good that can be developed with this breath coming in, this breath going out. So that's the right way to look at the present moment as your place for practice. Not as a place that you're trying to arrive, but it's your workspace. That when you do the work well, will take you to something deeper inside that's really not involved in now or then at all. It's not involved in near or far or between the two. But the way you get there is by working right here, right now. Whatever needs to be developed in the mind right now, whatever needs to be abandoned, you do that. The late king of Thailand once asked Lung Pudun, what order should the defilements be dealt with? And he said, whichever one arises first, deal with that one. In other words, you can't plan the practice ahead of time. But you want to have your tools ready, the tools of virtue, the tools of concentration, the tools of discernment, so that whatever problem the mind tosses up at you in the present moment, you've got the tools to deal with it. That's when you focus on the present moment will really bear fruit. <laughs>